the myth that government has benefited the poor at the expense of the rich. That's the myth. That's the, those are the terms on which many a governmental program is sold. What is the reality? The reality has been described in an article in the Journal of Law and Economics by my colleague George Stigler under the title of Director's Law. And Director is the name of Aaron Director, who was a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. And I might also say my brother-in-law. <laughs> Director's Law is that almost invariably government programs benefit the middle income class at the expense of the very poor and the very rich. Now, that, that may seem to you strange, but let me first explain why it makes logical sense, and second, give you some empirical evidence, starting right here at home with higher education and st the state financing of higher education. On the logical level, you have an economic, a political system under which laws are passed by 51% of the people voting one way against 49% of the people. Now, the way to get a law passed, therefore, is to form a coalition covering 51% of the people. You might think that you would take the bottom 51% versus the top 49%. But the more you think about it, the more you realize that that's not a very effective way to form a coalition. Why? Because those people who are at the bottom tend to be much less skillful in political activity for the very reasons that leave them at the bottom in the economic scale. They are at the bottom in the economic scale because they have low skills or low abilities or low entrepreneurial capacities or have been unfortunate to have been born handicapped or in groups that are discriminated against. But those same features make them relatively less effective in political activity. Who are the most effective people in political activity? Those of us at the, in the middle, in the middle, in the middle classes. Where are the people who are literate? Where are the people who write for the newspapers? Where are the people who mount the hustings? Where are the people who, who provide the candidates? Well, you might say, why doesn't the coalition come from the top all the way down 51%? Well, the answer is the G. Those people at the top, that's a place we can get a lot of money from. And it's worth sacrificing a few votes to get a large fraction of a tax base. And therefore, the logically most reasonable coalition is sort of 51% of the people running from the lower middle class through the upper middle class and leaving out the very rich at the top and the very poor at the bottom. Now, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the very rich are able to use their money to get a effective coalition, but most of the time that's the way it works. One of my favorite examples is state finance of higher education. This is always sold on the ground of providing opportunities to everybody in the society to get an education. But what are the facts? I doubt that there is any program financed by government in the United States which is as regressive in its impact and its financial impact as the financing of higher schooling. Who are the people who go to school? Who are the people who are attending this university? Mostly people who come from middle, upper middle or lower middle income class families. If there are a few among you who come from lower income families, you are going to be among the middle and upper income classes. You are the richer among the poor. They are the people who go to school. They are the people who get the benefit from it. Your training here will enable you to get higher incomes than you otherwise could. Who pays for it? Well, you pay for it, and your family and friends pay for it, not through tuition. I am told your tuition covers about 15% of the cost of your schooling. The taxpayers pay for it, including the people who don't go to school. Some years ago, there was a study made for the state of California which showed that 50% of the students at state-supported institutions of higher education came from the top 25% of the income class. And 5% came from the bottom 25% of the income class. I myself am a beneficiary of state support of higher education. I went through 
a school that has since become a state university, Rutgers University in the state of New Jersey, on a state scholarship. Now, I think I benefited from going to the university, although I know, and I think even maybe the, the country at large did, although I know there are many people who disagree with that. <laughs> but there's no reason why I shouldn't have paid for it. What did the poor citizens in New Jersey get? The day I graduated from college, I left New Jersey, and I've hardly ever been back since. There's a strong case to be made that everybody who wants to go to university should have an opportunity to do so, provided he's willing to pay for it. Not necessarily right now. It's highly desirable to have arrangements under which he can borrow now to pay it back later out of a higher income that his education will make possible. But there is no justification for imposing taxes on lower income people to finance the schooling of people who are or will be in the higher income groups. And yet, how much political movement is there to impose full cost tuition on colleges? There is nobody who would have a ghost of a chance of being elected to a legislature or to the state house on that program. It's the hardest thing in the world, legislatively, to get higher tuitions imposed. Why? because the middle class looks after itself, because of director's law. Now, what's true for higher education is true in every other area. Consider Social Security. Now, Social Security is also sold as a program to benefit the poor. What are the facts? Social Security is a program which imposes unduly heavy taxes on the lower income groups in the society to provide higher benefits to upper income groups in the society. How does it work? It's not because of the regressive nature of the wage tax. It's not because of the structure of benefits. It's because of a very simple phenomenon. At what age do younger men from the lower classes go to work? 16, 17, 18, 19. That's when they start to pay Social Security taxes. At what age are you people going to go to work and start paying Social Security taxes? Some of you may, in part-time jobs, have been doing so. But you will be a full-time Social Security pay, uh, payers only when you reach your middle 20s. So they will pay taxes for more years than you will pay taxes. Next, which one is going to receive benefits for longer? Every demographic study has shown that the average expected length of life of middle and upper income classes is longer than the average length of life of people from the lower income classes. So those poor suckers are going to pay taxes for more years <laughs> and receive payments for fewer years than you, than you and I will. Now some of us, by virtue of continuing to work between 65 and 72 will not be in that favored class. But already, the fraction of people who work between 65 and 72 has been cut to a small part of what it used to be because of the incentive offered by Social Security. And overall, there is little doubt, therefore, that Social Security is a program which transfers income from low-income classes to high-income classes. Same thing is true of almost every other social program you can mention. I have often challenged people to find a single governmental program in which the people who pay taxes have higher incomes than those who get the benefits. I know only one, and that's direct relief, public assistance, the aid to families of dependent children. It's not a good program, it's a terrible program, it's a welfare mess. But so far as I can find out, it's the only program that demonstrably transfers income from higher income classes to lower income classes. And that's why it's such an unpopular program. 